Today, we're taking a look at the Lockheed Model 10 Electra. This was the first in a moderate line of twin-engine aircraft designs that emerged in the 1930s. Notable for their exceptionally sleek lines and beautiful looks, most were used in the civil market, primarily as passenger airliners, but a few military designs emerged as well. I plan to cover all of these over the next month or so, so consider this the beginning of a sort of disjointed mini-series that I will continue after I return from my overseas trip next month. The Electra story begins in depressing times, literally. In 1932, the Lockheed Aircraft Company was an ill-fated subsidiary of the defunct Detroit Aircraft Corporation. Though the company had produced some good designs, including the world-famous and record-setting Lockheed Vega, it had not enjoyed huge commercial success. This would soon change when the Lockheed Aircraft Company was purchased and reformed into the Lockheed Aircraft Corporation in June 1932. Much of the finance was brought in by Robert E. Gross, an investment banker, and the company's management team soon elected a new president, Lloyd Stearman, himself already a well-established aircraft designer and manufacturer. At first, the new company planned to build a 10-seat, single-engine all-metal transport, which Stearman had drawn up earlier while doing work for Stearman Varney Incorporated. However, convinced that the future of passenger transport would depend on the development of clean and fast twin-engine aircraft, Robert Gross convinced his associates that they should abandon the single-engine design and go for a twin-engine design instead. This proved to be exceptionally fortuitous, as just a couple of years later, single-engine aircraft operating in the United States would be forbidden to carry passengers on scheduled flights at night, or over terrain unsuitable for emergency landings. And considering vast swathes of the US fit into that category, with the Rocky Mountains to the west and the Appalachians to the east, this could have been a real problem had Lockheed gone with the single-engine approach. This new aircraft continued the trend of Lockheed using celestial-themed names, and the Model 10 Electra was drawn up in the later part of 1933. To be built as a low-wing cantilever monoplane, it was to have accommodation for a crew of two and ten passengers. It was to be powered by a pair of Pratt & Whitney R985 Wasp Jr. air-cooled nine-cylinder radial engines that were to be enclosed by NACA-style cowlings and driving two-blade variable-pitch propellers. Before construction of a prototype was completed, scale models were tested in a wind tunnel at the University of Michigan. Initially, the design had a single vertical tail, wing to fuselage fillets, and a forward raked windshield. However, an assistant to Professor Edward Stalker, the aerodynamicist who'd been entrusted with the testing, identified these features as likely to cause stability problems. The assistant's name was Clarence L. Johnson, though most of us would know him simply as Kelly Johnson, one of the most prolific and influential US aircraft designers to ever live. But his future fame in working on such projects as the P-38 Lightning, the U-2, the F-104, and the SR-71 Blackbird, to name just a few, was still ahead of him, and Professor Stalker did not believe Johnson's report that the Model 10 would be unstable. Not long after this, in 1933, Kelly Johnson completed his master's degree, and he ended up joining the design team at Lockheed. The Model 10 was still incomplete by this stage, encountering various delays, and he convinced Hall Hibbard, the chief engineer at the time, that he believed it was still unstable, and he asked permission to conduct further testing. After wind tunnel testing of additional end plate fins near the end of the tailplane, Johnson proposed a twin fin and rudder design, and this proposal was quickly accepted, with the Model 10 now featuring what would rapidly become a trademark tail design for Lockheed aircraft in the interwar period. 
The prototype Electro was finally completed in February of 1934. On the 23rd of that month, and powered by 450 horsepower Wasp Junior SBs, it was flown for the first time at Burbank, with pilot Marshall Heedle at the controls. The initial test flight results soon confirmed Johnson in his other recommendations, that the wing fillets, curved fairings at the wing roots, should be removed, and that the windshield should be modified to a different shape. This was experimented with, and the finalised windshield would not be settled upon until the production of the Electra was already underway, with the fifth production aircraft being selected for the final design. With the modifications made, the performance and handling characteristics of the aircraft were deemed to be excellent, and the prototype Electra completed its airworthiness trials at Los Angeles in the spring. Following this, the Electra went through the process of getting its CAA-approved type certificate, allowing it to be operated commercially, and Lockheed began to rapidly collect production orders from various customers throughout the spring and the summer months. Production models of the Electra would eventually total 148 aircraft built across four commercial and five military variants. By far the most numerous produced was the first, the Electra 10-A, with 101 of the 148 total being of this type. These were delivered to four US airliners, 10 overseas airlines, a few private customers, and a couple went to various governments. In its original form, it had a wingspan of 55 feet, a length of 38 feet 7 inches, and a height of 10 feet 1 inch. It was good for a top speed of 210 miles an hour, and a cruising speed of 190 miles an hour over a maximum range of 810 miles. After the Model 10A, there was the 10B through to the E. 18 10Bs were built, and they were the only major variant to not use the Wasp Junior, instead being powered by 440 horsepower Wright R1975 E3 whirlwinds. They were sold to three US airlines, Eastern Airlines being the dominant customer, one being foreign, and one being a private customer as well. The Model 10C was the result of interest by Pan American Airways, who requested the engine to be changed to the 450 horsepower Wasp SC-1, an engine they had in surplus. Eventually, eight aircraft were produced to this modified specification, with delivery being complete by May of 1935. The Model 10D was a projected military development of the Electra, but it was never built, and the Model 10E was another order for Pan American and its subsidiaries. This model came with more powerful engines, the 660 horsepower Wasp S3H1, and it also found customers in the private market who valued high performance designs. A few Electras were also built for experimental use, the most notable becoming known as the XC-35. This was a single, unique version of the aircraft that had been ordered by the War Department as a testbed for pressurised cabins and high-altitude operations. Lockheed designed a new fuselage of circular cross-section with heavy doors, smaller windows, and internal bracing to cope with the stresses of pressurisation, but the original wing and tail services remained the same. To provide cabin pressurisation and the necessary high-altitude performance, the experimental and turbo-supercharged Pratt & Whitney XR1340-43 engine was selected. Ground testing began in early 1937, and the aircraft was very soon nicknamed the Boiler, on account of some deeply distressing noises made by the doors, which leaked noisily when cabin pressure was first applied. After some quick modifications, the aircraft ceased sounding like an aggravated tea kettle, and it went up for its first flights in May of that year. With many of the tests conducted at the hands of Lieutenant Ben Kelsey, the XC-35 provided the Air Corps and the aircraft industry with vital research data and experience in the use of pressurised cabins and turbo-supercharged engines. Moreover, it also made some spectacular and record-setting flights, including one from Chicago to Washington, where it averaged 350 miles an hour at 20,000 feet. In terms of its actual service life, the Model 10s was especially varied. It began primarily, as it was intended, as a commercial transport. 
It was operated in the United States by Chicago and Southern, Continental, Delta, Eastern, Hanford, National Airways, Northwest, and Pan American. Like the larger Boeing 247 and the Douglas DC-2, the Electra offered a degree of comfort not previously experienced in US commercial aviation, and its high cruising speed, 190 miles an hour, the same as the DC-2 despite the Electra having far less power, endeared it to its passengers. The Electra was beautiful, sleek, fast, and comfortable. Unfortunately, its smaller size let it down when it came to the most important metric in commercial air travel, and that was cost. Its seat cost per mile was slightly higher than its competition, and this, combined with the reduced seating capacity, 10 on the Electra versus 14 on the DC-2, reduced the Electra's attractiveness to major airlines during a time of exceedingly fierce competition as America's economy was finally bouncing back after the Great Depression. Because of this, several airlines replaced their Electras with larger aircraft in the late 30s and early 40s. By 1942, of the US domestic fleet of 322 aircraft, just 16 were still Model 10 Electras. But this was not the end of the Electra, not by any measure at all. Some would still be operated commercially in the United States well into the late 1960s, obviously on smaller routes, but still in service nonetheless. Additionally, a large number of Electras were pressed into use as military transports during the war. In the US, they were redesignated as the C-36A, B, and C, and they were used almost exclusively within the continental United States. However, several Electras were also purchased by the British, and they saw widespread use as general and personal transports, with one being used by the RAF as the personal transport for the governor of Bengal. Of course, perhaps the most famous event tied to the Electra happened before the Second World War, way back in 1937. In July 1936, a special version of the Model 10E was built to the specifications of aviation pioneer Amelia Earhart, who was planning a series of flights to circumnavigate the world. Modifications included the installation of large fuel tanks in the fuselage, taking the capacity from 200 to 1200 US gallons, or 4,542 litres, and additional navigational equipment was also installed, notably a DF loop above the cabin. Earhart made her first attempt on March the 17th, 1937, with Captain Harry Manning as her navigator, assisted by Fred Noonan, but it did not succeed. Having started from Oakland in California, they were taking off from Luke Field on Ford Island when the aircraft entered an uncontrolled ground loop that damaged the landing gear, fuselage underside, and both propellers. There was much debate on the cause of the incident. Some claimed a burst right tyre, some blamed a landing gear collapse, and some blamed pilot's error, but either way, the flight was severely delayed as repairs had to be made. This had a knock-on effect that has been considered by some to be significant in Earhart's disappearance. Captain Manning, who was not only a navigator, but also a pilot, and the only one of the three considered to be a skilled radio operator, abandoned his assistance in the flight as it had already taken up a lot of his planned personal absence. This left just Earhart and Noonan, who made their second attempt once repairs had been completed. Flying west to east, their Lockheed Electra carried them from Oakland to Miami, then through the Caribbean, South America, Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. And then, en route from New Guinea to Howland Island, they vanished. And for the next 80 plus years, people have been arguing about how and why they vanished. Did they run out of fuel, ditch in the ocean, and drown? Were they captured by the Japanese after straying too far north and being accused of spying? Or did they land on a deserted island, only to starve, and then get eaten by coconut crabs? Who knows, but that is a topic beyond the scope of today's video. Despite the black mark on its history for being Earhart's Chariot of Doom, the Model 10 Electra proved itself to be a fast, reliable, and capable transport. 
if a little on the small side. It had already been on the way out of major service by the time the US found itself at war, and after 1945, it's found itself being used by small so-called feeder airlines or private operators. The type did continue to see service for some considerable time in Central and South America, being used by Brazil, Costa Rica, Ecuador and Panama to name a few, all the way up to the 1960s. Though not produced in massive numbers, quite a few Model 10s survive today, partly thanks to several being in private hands for a considerable amount of time. Most are on display, or under restoration in the United States, including the XC35, which is currently in storage slash preservation, and there are a couple kicking about in Canada and New Zealand as well. Though not perfect as a transport, the Electra was a very good aircraft, and the first twin-engine design to be built by Lockheed. But it would not be the last, and the Model 10 quickly evolved into such designs as the Electra Junior, the Super Electra, and the militarised Lockheed Hudson. But those aircraft will cover another day. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the Patreon supporters. Now this is the last video that will go live before I am away in the UK for the next four weeks, so I won't be able to update the Patreon list until I return, as I've obviously pre-recorded everything for the next few weeks. FYI, I will be attending the Royal International Air Tattoo on the 15th, more details to follow soon. A big thank you of course to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier supporters, and a warm welcome to David Rabinowitz, who is the newest member of this special group. Right, I'm off to uh, furiously begin packing preparations, but as always, thank you all for your continued support, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.